Hello, I'm Karen Quattrimoni, the Director of Public Relations for Object Management Group, OMG. Welcome to our OMG podcast series. At OMG, we're known for driving industry standards and building tech communities. Today, we're focusing on the Augmented Reality for Enterprise Alliance area, which is an OMG program. The area accelerates AR adoption by creating a comprehensive ecosystem for enterprises, providers, and research institutions. Today, Boeing's Sam Neblett will host the podcast session. So I know you have a huge amount of experience in the gaming sphere, and that's with your podcast, that's with just your personal time. Uh, and. I think gaming, the gaming sphere is kind of leading the way for the, for informing enterprises on how they can use AR both effectively and efficiently in a, just a wide variety of settings. You mentioned firearms training that guns are pretty popular in video games. Mm -hmm. Um, but I want to think about, uh, real world examples of kind of thinking outside of the box for industry specific applications and potential or interesting use cases that you've noticed. So not necessarily just picking up a, a, a gun with a controller. I'm thinking anything new and groundbreaking that you've seen or you feel could be on the horizon, something like I mean, it might not have to be super complicated, but just an out of the box solution. So something like voice commands for hands free machine controlling manufacturing. Uh, hand gestures and sterile surgery for sterile surgery and healthcare, or overcoming issues that you've noticed in UI and UX for learning curves with eye tracking and AR applications that you've seen. Is there anything very interesting in a specific industry that uh, the enterprise might be interested in for AR? Yeah, I think, um, you know, quickly just to touch on one of the things you just mentioned there, the eye tracking and hand gestures mm -hmm. for UI navigation, I think is is crucial. Right. Um, you know, b previously, before these technologies, if you're using a, a virtual reality controller or an AR controller, um, a lot of times when you're holding one of these controllers in your hand, there's like a laser that comes off of the yeah. edge of it that you can point at it at objects in the UI to make menu selections and things like that. When you drop these controllers, boom, now it's like, oh, where's my laser? Like in, wh in what way can I make okay. my next menu selection? And I think if you've used the Apple Vision Pro, that's exactly it. I think that is the, the best current method to solving UI and UX problems is by glancing at something and having a pinch gesture. You can cruise okay. through menus so fast like that. Um, if you've never used the Apple Vision Pro, I highly recommend you go to an Apple store and check one out. You know, it's a quick demo um, and very quickly you'll start to understand, I think, the direction that a lot of this stuff is going. Now, granted, the Apple Vision Pro is, I guess, technically a, a, a consumer device, mm -hmm. but I, I think that the intended uses of that device really like lead to where we're going in this conversation. Um, okay. it's, it's funny that you mentioned voice commands. I haven't actually seen any compelling use cases for voice commands. Neither have I. Yeah. Which I, I find interesting, you know, because it seems like some low hanging fruit and, yeah. you know, in the gaming side of things, I see people doing some really interesting stuff with AI and voice commands by basically connect, connecting a chat GPT to the game that you're playing and attaching individual personas to NPCs in the world. Um, I have a friend named Ging Gingus VR who makes a lot of cool stuff for VR and AR and uses like peripherals, haptics and all that kind of stuff in her content. And she will be playing a game like Skyrim VR and will walk up to somebody and say, hey, what do you think about dragons? And like the AI will connect to the NPC and create like a brand new, never before heard of like, line of dialogue using that character's voice, which is really, really cool. But in terms of like enterprise solutions and stuff, I haven't seen anybody use anything okay. that like I found compelling, which um, I find interesting. Uh, in some of our trainings, we do have sections uh, of like the aircraft trainings where the user is prompted to speak out loud, but mm -hmm. it's all like, um, it's like implied, you know what I right. mean? It's like, okay, now you say this and you say it out loud and then you hit okay you know, and move on to the next thing. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I, I do find that interesting. Okay. Um, in terms of some like kind of interesting and outside of the box use cases, um, like I said, I am a haptics industry professional and my brain kind of goes to some of the haptics use cases there. And it's funny because um, there's, there's a couple of companies that do this, but there are some electro stimuli haptic suits that exist out there. One of them is made by a company called Tesla suit. Um, and another one in the gaming side of things is made by a company called OO, O W O. And these haptics are not fun. They are not comfortable. It's, it's a lot of friction to get into these devices because, because they are using electro stimuli, the nodes that attach to your skin can't have clothing in between. Mm -hmm you and it so to wear the tesla suit which i put on at ces 2019 i think so it's been a while now um i had to basically get naked at, at a conference to put this thing on you know i had my underwear on still but otherwise like my whole body was inside of this suit and uh, the owo technology is very very similar except for it's just a shirt and it is designed to be used in games however the sensation of these have you used one of these by the way sam i've used the oo suit yeah you used the oo, OO? I that thing is not comfortable suit. is it no it, it and it's 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 not fun to have to put have all your users get in it and then you have to worry about things like cleanliness we have to use five on motion tracking shoot suits too so i have to take it home and wash it and, yeah. so for all of those reasons i would say it's not really good. It's not really worth it. They're expensive. They're uncomfortable to get into and out of. And the haptic sensation physically actually hurts. You're being shocked, which by the way, I learned electrocuted should only be used when referring to death because it's like cution, you know, like yeah. execution, right. electrocution. So unless you died, you didn't get electrocuted. You got shocked, which is something okay. that took me forever to learn. But this thing shocks you. And, um, you know, some of the sensations are akin to like scratches and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I do see, however, a compelling use case for negative reinforcement in training, right. because like, let's say we are doing the oil, the oil rig training, um, you know, snipping the wrong wire or pulling the wrong lever could mean literal death for everybody out mm -hmm. there. Like some of these things, like the re there's a reason why we're using immersive technologies to train some of mm -hmm. this stuff, because it's very dangerous. It's scary to learn these things, you know, in medical procedures, um, you know, we've, we've at context yeah, we've done some stuff with children, um, Cincinnati children's hospital. And we went in there last week, uh, for a demo and I'm like looking at these like little, uh, like, I don't know, like fake cadaver things and stuff like that, mm. that they have. And I'm realizing, wow, they're actually performing operations on children in here, you know, mm. and like they need to practice these procedures because messing up a little bit could mean, you know, something terrible happening to a child. So it's really, really important that we learn these things and take these trainings seriously. And if you've used the OO vest or the Tesla suit vest, it, it only takes one shock for you to realize you don't want that to happen. Right. Again. And Thank now you. My like when I did the game for oh well, my head was on a swivel in a way that it would not have been mm -hmm. if I didn't have that negative reinforcement happening. So while I don't recommend these devices for something like gaming, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess if you're a streamer and you're like want some like shock value or something, you could buy one and use it. But yeah. at the end of the day, um, I don't see a, a practical use case other than negative reinforcement using haptics in a training where it could necessarily be a life okay. or death situation. That's fair. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we talked about some benefits and challenges that you mentioned, challenges like, I mean, it hurts or it's difficult to put on uh, one of the EMS or TENS based vests like the OO suit um, and reducing cognitive load as a benefit and uh, increased safety because you can practice surgery before actually going to do the real thing like you're mentioning. But what other challenges do you think you see with some of the new, newer modalities um, like user acceptance, are they going to, are the people familiar with controllers? Are they going to get frustrated with using hand tracking or eye tracking now? Do you see any accuracy limitations with hand tracking or eye tracking or the glove that, uh, the contact CI glove for haptics? Is it, is it, is it not quite accurate enough that you're working on it? Uh, security concerns, you mentioned PII. That might be something that the EU has to worry about collecting PII for advertisement purposes or whatever, yeah. uh, aging IT infrastructure, can our IT systems and enterprise take this stuff? Is it ready? Are these companies working with, say, Microsoft, Azure, and AWS to really get them accepted in a more formal way? Or is it still kind of the Wild West? 
we think. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, in terms of like infrastructure and stuff like that, I think we're good to go. I think, you know, most people have computers that can handle this type of technology. I mean, I guess if you might have to acquire some hardware to pull some of this stuff off, but it all works pretty well with existing technologies. So I don't think we have too much to worry about there. Um, you know, you, you, you touched on a lot of really good stuff there, you know, um, but I think in terms of like some of the challenges with some with accepting some of these things, um, I think user acceptance actually is a pretty big one. Uh, you know, people they resist change. You know, like there's a lot of people, especially in like the DoD side of things. Like there's some guys who have been in those roles for decades, mm -hmm. literal decades, and like the way they've been doing things has worked. You know, like they're not in a big hurry to make a huge change to the infrastructure of their training. That's gonna like take years to fully implement and all of that stuff, especially when they're used to seeing the results that they expect. Um, but uh, other than some of the things that you kind of touched on there, um, you know, I think that scalability is a really big one. I think that there is like, if, if, I, if I'm trying to sell somebody on using AR or VR for training, I would probably lean into something like scalability. Um, okay. You know, traditional trainers for the Air Force, for example, um, are insanely expensive to build you know it's basically a fake cockpit using all of like the real stuff that a cockpit's made out of um it costs a lot of money to build they can only exist in one place at one time and only one person can occupy it at a time and also typically you'll probably need a second body there as an instructor and as an instructor to explain what's happening but if you had an ar or a vr application that was designed to train people in a virtual environment um this is a program that you could slap on a hundred headsets and send to everybody and say, all right, everybody, here's your homework, spend an hour or two in this virtual cockpit. And then when everybody comes in the next day, they all have so much more experience than they did before. And you're able to scale this training and, and scale your ability to share this information with across your workforce or across your whatever, um, in a way that was previously inaccessible. So I see a huge opportunity for scalability of training that would require you being on site, having something really expensive or large, um, or something that would be incredibly dangerous to participate in. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So moving on to future outlook, um, you mentioned how the enterprise can expect to use these different interaction modalities in the next five to 10 years. Are there any particular companies that you expect to have a massive impact on the AR space? Uh, and then what are like some high level steps that companies can do to prepare to integrate these new AR solutions? So that could be hand tracking, start looking at gloves, start integrating them, maybe start using, if you're using Unity or Unreal, uh, import the new, like for Unity, for example, the XR hands, toolkit and start supporting that in your inner your uh, your input code uh, what do you think companies to watch that you expect to have a massive impact on the AR space five to ten years and then what can companies do to what can companies within the enterprise do to prepare for these advancements um cool I'll start with the with the latter portion of this uh, I think if you've made it this far in this conversation and like you're like considering mm -hmm. maybe like getting into some of the stuff then now is a great time to start doing some of the stuff that you mentioned you know start sure. taking a look at the different hand tracking solutions that exist maybe d get a couple of different HMDs and start playing around like I said go to the Apple store do a demo there like experience what it feels like to have eye hand eye tracking and hand tracking working in conjunction with each other um, this is definitely the time because the technology is moving very rapidly, you know, like we're looking, I mean, they, they could put out a headset, an AR headset and a VR headset mm -hmm. once a year that would like set a new standard for the technology, you know, so things are moving really, really quick. And I wouldn't expect to have something that meets all of your expectations today. Um, and I, I say expectations in quote marks because I do feel like the general public has a somewhat inflated idea of what to expect when they use a lot of these technologies. You know, we are raised on incredible science fiction films in media and stuff like that, that sh honestly show us a lot of tech 10, 20, 30, 40 years in advance. You know, um, one of my favorite movies ever is Total Recall starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. And if you watch that movie, you will see so many technologies that did not exist when that movie came out that are now commonplace in the real world. And like, 
most people who would watch that movie today would just like they would they wouldn't notice that it would just kind of go in one and out the other and they're like okay mm -hmm. cool yeah they're doing a video chat but like i remember being younger and watching people do video chats in movies being blown away that that might actually be something that we can do um however a lot of people when they think about ar they think about vr they have this expectation that when they put an hmd on it's like literally like stepping into a portal and it's going to like change everything you know and when they see a little bit of a friction or a little bit of lag here or maybe the haptics don't line up perfectly they kind of just want to th throw it out you know throw it out the window um i would say you know don't have unrealistic expectations of the technology of where it is today but i think it's safe to assume that these all this technology is going to reach utterly profound levels it, within our lifetimes you know like the, the type of profound where like you will be changed by 10, 20 minute experiences <laughs> putting on the headset. Mm -hmm. Um, so I definitely see all of that happening. Um, in terms of companies to watch, I, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, mm -hmm. there's definitely a few that have been making waves and have been pushing the envelope. Um, snap is one of them. Snapchat has been using AR filters. They're basically like the first company to like actually get like wide adoption of AR technology, at least that I have seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many people using Snapchat filters to send videos and stuff like that to their friends. Um, they're working on a lot of AR stuff. So I think that's a company that's really worth looking at. Um, Niantic does a lot of really cool stuff. They made Pokemon Go and similar AR games. Like you said, gaming kind of paves the way for a lot of these things. Um, I think that's the case here as well. Uh, also Meta, you know, mm -hmm. there are concerns with Facebook owning a company that does a lot of this stuff, right? Like being a, a data collection company, um, you know, there's some privacy concerns there, but in terms of like the R and D and the money that's being spent on pushing all this stuff forward, I don't think there's another company that does what Meta does. Um, right. They they are pushing things so, so hard. So uh, I would pay attention to the products that Meta is putting out over the next five to 10 years. Um, in terms of where I kind of see a lot of the stuff going, um, I think we're going to see this incredible blend of biometric data, immersive technology, and procedurally generated content that is going to create these amazingly immersive experiences for people that are totally individualized and completely custom to exactly what it is that you need to get out of that experience. So for example, let's say you have a training program that is using all these technologies. It is reading my biometric data in real time, my, my eyes, my, my facial expressions, all of that stuff. It sees my pupils dilating and, and focusing and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it can, maybe there's some kind of BCI that can tell my level of engagement, you know? Mm -hmm. So the procedurally generated content in real time can read my biometric data and feed to me the content that's necessary to get the desired outcome out of my biometrics. So maybe they're looking for a specific level of engagement, or maybe they're trying to scare me or, or make me mm -hmm. experience fear. It can like keep ramping up the fear levels until it gets to the point where it's getting the response out of me that it's looking for. So if when you combine that with, you know, when you combine all these these things, this I, these biometric data, um, having it be an immersive experience where you really feel like you're connected to what's happening and it being procedural and custom to the to the user, I think it's going to be insanely potent. I think they'll be able to identify your weaknesses in a training relatively quickly and start to address those weaknesses in real time. Um, and that's super, super exciting. Of course, like I said earlier, it comes with safety concerns. Mm -hmm. We all basically are going to have to get rid of the idea of privacy and stuff like that, I think, yeah. at some point. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I, I, I don't. I think the, the trains left the station, you know, like I think mm -hmm. trying to prevent these technologies from integrating with people is like trying to fight the tide. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like this is nature. We are naturally connecting with technology more and more and more all the time. As a baby, a computer boops up and you, you crawl towards it. Like we are mm -hmm. instinctually driven to connect with the stuff. And to me, it's natural. So I say, uh, you know, just hang on and, you know, like I'm, I'm throwing my hands up on the roller coaster. You know, I'm just like, all right, let's go. Woo. Cause it's going to be fun and exciting. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm here for it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, so is there anything that anything else that you would like to plug before we think we're good on everything else? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you find uh, this conversation and, and my perspective on some of this stuff interesting, I would highly recommend you come and check out Between Realities, uh, the podcast that I do with my partner, Skiva. Um, we do live episodes every Friday as, as long as time permits. And, you know, we don't have like work obligations and travels and things like that right. getting in the way. But um, we always have a guest on our show. So every week we have somebody either from the gaming space, the enterprise space, you know, the training space. We get developers, CEOs youtubers like the whole gambit like basically anybody who cares about this technology as much as we do regardless of what they're doing could be somebody that we would have on to the show and we really do like to kind of peel away layers talk about the the nitty gritty gritty of all this stuff focus on some of the individuals who are like really making a difference in the space um and giving a voice to some people who are like us who are just trying to get involved and mm -hmm. come and be a part of it um of course, if you're interested in some of the haptic stuff that I mentioned, definitely check out Contact CI. Uh, we are doing a lot right now that's currently available and behind the scenes to improve some of like the haptic fidelity and stuff like that that you were mentioning earlier, which, by the way, I will say um, fidelity of hand tracking and haptics has a long way to go. But I mentioned earlier, it exists in a state that is enough to kind of bridge the gap from your hands to your brain to allow you to have a more immersive experience than you would if the haptics didn't exist. A demo I like to do often is having a, a gloved hand and an ungloved hand. And like mm -hmm. you reach out and like interact with some buttons and switches with a gloved hand and then reach out and do it with your bare hand. And the difference is night and day. Like one of them feels real, mm -hmm. however you want to define real. Right. And the other one doesn't. You know, so um, I really do think that there is a huge value for haptics right now, even if it isn't entirely lifelike. And I do expect it to get to that point. Um, so yeah, between realities and um, and contacts AI are definitely like my two primary things that uh, if you wanted to follow up with me to reach out. Um, and also, I'll say that I do a lot of traveling and I go to a lot of conferences and events. So if you ever want to meet up, um, I'll be I don't know when this comes out, but I'll be at in AWE and at AWE in June in Long Beach. Um, and I go to basically all of the the AR VR and, and tech focused conferences so feel free to reach out to me anytime um, send me a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn and uh, we can connect what's your Twitter handle for my Twitter handle is Alex VR but there's some underscores in it it's like Alex underscore underscore VR okay. but I think if you type Alex VR you'll probably get to me okay awesome well thank you so much for your time and all of your input and expertise Alex and Thank for you, anyone Sam. else who might be interested, just like Alex said, uh, check out his podcast and contact CI. We'll get your email listed wherever we can host this. But yeah, thank you again and take care. It's been great having you. Thanks, Sam. Looking forward to our next chat. Talk to you yeah. soon.